So we have with us our moderator, Dr. Bajoy K. Thomas, Associate Professor and Dean of IISCR Pune. Uh, he's somebody who's who integrates water management, focusing on river basins, and his interdisciplinary research addresses the adaptation, water access, equity, as well as fairness. We also have with us the panelist, Dr. Ajit Saudi, Deputy Chief Engineer of uh, Sewage Operations of uh, BMC, joining us. Dr. Ajit brings in about 30 plus years of experience in sewage system planning and maintenance and specializes in environmental issues like water, wastewater recycling and plastic management. He, then we also have Sri Shankar Deshpande, who is the Chief Town and Planning, uh, Country Planning Division of MMRTA. He's going to be joining us uh, online. Uh, somebody who is a dynamic leader, he oversees the urban development in key areas. We also have Ms. Renu uh, Gera, who is a senior environmental expert at uh, General Consultants. Ms. Gera uh, brings in around 40 years of experience in both corporate as well as development uh, sector and she's somebody who began her career at Tata Consulting uh, Engineers, uh, designing the sewage networks and treatment plants. We also have Mr. Anshuman, Director of Water Resources Division. Uh, Terry, who's going to be joining us. Mr. Anshuman, thank you so much. Bringing in over 25 years in the water sector and specializing in integrated water resource management, efficiency, quality, assessment, and regulatory compliance. We also have Mr. Srinivas Vidala, who's the CEO of the WASH Innovation uh, Hub of ASCII. Uh, Professor Srinivas uh, specializes in urban infrastructure and service delivery, and he also focuses on the water and environmental sanitation services. Somebody who also, of course, chairs the Amrut Startup Water Challenge and co-instituting the National Urban Water Awards Program. With that, uh, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, our wonderful lady for joining us today. And uh, with the interest of time, I've kept your introductions short, uh, but we feel that you have a lot more to contribute. So we've started at 12.53. Can we look at uh, 1.53 as holistic six, uh, 60 minutes? Thank you. Over to you, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, greetings from the World Water Day. Uh, so, water is important, so is food. So, uh, so this panel won't stay between you and lunch, and we will finish on time. Uh, so, I'm uh, Bijoy. I, uh, I live in Pune. I work at ISA Pune. So I've been living in Pune for the past five years. So before that, for uh, more than a decade, I lived in Bangalore. And since Bangalore has been discussed quite a bit uh, in, in the media, and also we have heard quite a bit about Bangalore uh, in, in today's uh, sessions and from speakers. Uh, so if, for people who have worked in Bangalore on water, so this was not at all a surprise that at some point, Bangalore, Bangalore would actually be facing such a crisis. So people have been warning it, so time and again there has been signals. So I think at some point uh, there has, uh, what has been lacking is a concerted effort. Uh, looking at the sources of water, uh, the use of water, and also conservation of water in our respective realms. So I think uh, other cities actually have a lesson to learn from Bangalore. Uh, Pune for instance, or for that matter Mumbai. Um, so seemingly from the outside it would uh, look as if uh, we have plenty of water. But then I think the, the action and also the thinking towards that should start now and not really uh, wait for a crisis to happen. So even now, uh, Mumbai has water cuts and, and so on. So these are uh, some warning signals for us to probably think about what, what are the strategies for water conservation as we move ahead. Uh, so before I open uh, it up to the pa panelists, I just have one uh, point to make. Because ultimately when we talk about freshwater conservation or water, so what we are doing is actually putting some normative goals of uh, equity, efficiency, sustainability and so on. So we heard about uh, preventing water leakage um, uh, through unaccounted for water or through other means. So which contributes to efficiency. Similarly, we talked about, uh, we heard about uh, having water for future generations which has to do with sustainability. So similarly, there are other pressing issues as well. So one aspect which has not been discussed much maybe in the last session was about uh, the division of water between different segments of the society and different sections of uh, urban areas. So between the rich and the poor, between say the slum areas and the societies and so on. So I hope some of those issues will also come up in our panel. Secondly, the, the aspect of sanitation and how that can actually be effectively uh, provided. 
uh, to everybody, I mean, not just uh, people who can afford it. So that's also something which uh, we really need to think about. And finally, on uh, when we talk about wastewater reuse, uh, some of the aspects that we need to consider is also about people who are downstream, because when we talk about reuse for the city, oftentimes it is also release water and then it goes downstream for uh, agriculture and other purposes. So we need to look at it in a more integrated, uh, connected fashion rather than just looking at the city itself. So city is not living by itself, it's also getting uh, resources, water and other resources from the Piriyavan and rural areas. So this integration also has to be kept in mind when we talk about uh, challenges in freshwater management. So uh, we'll just uh, now uh, move ahead with the panelists. Um, so first let me invite uh, Dr. Salvi uh, to make his presentation. I guess he has a PowerPoint presentation, right? Please go. Thank you. Uh, considering the time constraint, I will try to be a very short and I will not repeat whatever that discussed in the morning session. So, So basically, uh, after the initial session about the water conservation and all, now the second session is what what are what will be the strategies, uh, how to conserve it, what are the different ways. So my focus will be what I will be talking mainly about the recycle and reuse of the treated waste water, and that to what I will restrict to the present status and future are the plans for the BMS. So so far the uh, agenda is concerned. So just it can be introductory talk about the present scenario in the uh, water in the say India, then sewerage system of the Mumbai. But the major focus will be on the recycle and reuse of the treated waste water. That is what what is the present status and what will be the future plan. So that will be the major aspect. Just to go ahead, say some of the some of the details or some of the data. CPCB report in 2021 gives that the the increasing need of the water to meet the domestic requirement. It is mainly because of the urbanization. But at the same time, wastewater discharge into the receiving water bodies, deteriorating is quality. So there are two aspects. There is a water demand and there is a contamination of the water is also there. So this is what published. Now lots of uh, discussion about the, uh, the percentage and all. But I think sometimes the picture speaks louder than the words and all. So this is what, what we observe. But definitely at this forum, some of the people are interested in figures also. So this is what my figure, or you can say that uh, as per the UN standard, whatever is required is 1,700 cubic meter. At, at this stage, we do not have that per capita water availability in India. So that is what the figure says. Now on the wastewater side, if you see, this is what general scenario. I am not talking about Mumbai, but general scenario. So this is what we observe. Again, if you are interested in the say uh, figures, facts and figures, so this is what this somewhere facts and figure maybe somewhere around 2019 or uh, 2020, some, some changes are definitely happened. But if you see, uh, without going into much more detail, say estimated sewage generation is around 72,000 MLD. And just come to the last point, that is what complied treatment, as per the treatment standard, as per the CPC requirement, as per the pollution standard, uh, say uh, state pollution control board requirement, it is almost up, up to 12,000 MLD. So what happens to uh, uh, the remaining sewage? So I always say in a lighter mode, goes to Ganga Maya or say whatever it may be. So that is what, say if you come to the Maharashtra, maybe the river will be different. So that is what happening and then we talk about the other aspect. Now, say when you talk about the pollution aspect, morning, since morning we are talking about the health aspect also. So this is the India Water Portal, September 2019 data. Annually, about 33 million Indians are affected by the water board disputes. 1.5 million, million children died due to diarrhea and 73 million working days are lost leading to the economic burden of 36,500 million a year. And we are talking about how much loss happened because of COVID. That is a problem and this is happening every year. So that is the point I, actually, I, I just want to highlight here. Now with this, what is the thing? Thing is what particularly? The city like Mumbai, this is what happening. The urban areas, new users, 
particularly those who are not aware about their aspect is what take flush and forget. Next day PMC will supply <laughs> sufficient water. So they are not worried. Okay. And that quite subsidized rate. That quite subsidized rate, so nobody is bothered. Now we have to make some changes. That is to what paradigm shift. So it is no longer take flush and forget. So it, it should be what? Some change. Maybe you use it, but at the end, again, again, you reuse. Some paradigm shift is required. I can talk, say, hours together on this, but then considering the time constraint, I'm going. So what paradigm shift is required? Say, sewage, reuse, and recycling. Consider as a resource. And to be very frank, wherever possible, not a centralized plant, decentralized plants are also, uh, say, maybe a requirement. Finally, forget about the linear economy, try to focus on the circular economy. That is what the requirement. Coming to the in a shorter way to the Mumbai aspect, say only everybody is interested in water and wastewater. So water supply is around 3850 MLD and the generated sewage generated is of 2190 million liter per day. Very interesting is what this system is laid by the Britishers, majority of the system, and still it is well maintained by the BMC people with some rehabilitation work. Always not to criticize BMC, some good work is also done, and that is very credited. Now, coming to the sewerage part, so these are the various sewerage zones are there and if you see this table, you will find that except Kulaba, all other plants are commissioned way back somewhere in 20-25 years back. So they are not matching the standard as, re as required by the new, new discharge standard given by the Honorable Institute. So Kulaba plant is commissioned in April 2020, that is as per the requirement of the discharge standard given by the Honorable Institute. I would like to highlight here, April 2020, it was a COVID situation and BMC was commissioning the new treatment plan. That is also again a credit to the BMC. Very interesting part. Now, say when you talk about the, uh, the, uh, the sewage benchmark, the only I want to focus on the last part, that is the recycling and reuse of the sewage or treated wastewater. The benchmark is 20%. 20% and as you are aware, we are not matching, not, not I'm talking about Mumbai, but anyway, as it is, as the already previous speaker says that sufficient quantity of water is available. But this is not so, we have to think about the water scarcity, water security, say for example, last year, you know, Akse, we, we talked about the global warming, climate change. In Mumbai last year, if you can see on Google also, August 2023, 20, the in month of August 23, in Mumbai rainfall was around 176 millimeters, as against the average is somewhere around 575 millimeters. So that is what is happening. And if this thing will happen, so definitely they, they, we have to think about this particular aspect also. But still, people are not habitual with that. So what we have done is what we have placed the decentralized STPs, and where small small STPs are there, and where treated water is being used for gardening and for other purposes. You can see that on the second, that Bandhagam from pumping station, this particular treated wastewater is supplied to the Rajgaon, which is the, uh, say, home for the governor. So, down the period, over a four or five years, we can say, if the Rajgaon is using treated wastewater, why not the public? That is the basic idea. Though, maybe it is a subsidized rate. Now, this is what the, our future plans. So, already, this, uh, uh, no, no, no need to talk about all this detail, but you are aware that uh, these particular plants or uh, the construction is already started. I want to just focus on the recycle part. That is what in every plant, almost 50% of the capacity is there for recycle and reuse. And you can say that uh, down the line around say 4 to 5 years, 1,270 billion liter of the treated wastewater will be available for the reuse, for non portable reuse. And that is the possibility. So what is required is what just we have to develop the behavior, habit of using that. So, this is our Kulaba plant, uh, 37 MLD, already commissioned in April 2020. Problem is what? Tre treated water use, what is the problem? Is what? Again, so many things are there, we can discuss it a lot. I will just focus on the rate, rate uh, the uh, aspect. Caring for the fresh water and recycled water, already someone has already discussed. We are supplying a very subsidized rate and we are trying to sell our treated wastewater at the actual rate. That is the problem. So we have to supply it at the subsidized rate. That is what the requirement. And I have discussed it on the various forum. And this is needed. Public awareness. Even today also, yesterday's water is considered as the stale water. And they are just throwing it. Yeah, yeah. And, and here, here at the same time, we are talking about to use the treated wastewater. 
so that is the aspect it is not the problem of technology technology is sufficient people are engineers are competent bmc is competent not only bmc any urban body government is competent they are having all lots of technology but this public awareness is very much important so on a lighter note i can say that say we have to find out different ways in singapore they are talking that new water and everything these are our swedish consultants they have in their in their say uh, country they have used waste water for making beer very nice some people say why not produce that on 31st of december we will finish off and this is not the this is not the google this is not the google photograph as i am always uh, said talking about the recycle and reuse of treated waste water they just gifted me this way and i am using it for attending for the so with the, uh, the, the time possibly i have just restricted and tried to focus the my main aspect so whenever the other time get i will definitely have to talk in much more detail thank you thank you so we are going to continue So thank you so much. Um, so probably during the discussion, we can also take up what things like uh, decentralized uh, treatment plants and how viable they are for the for the city. So may I now invite um, uh, Mr. Desh Pandey, who is uh, joining us online. Um, okay. Okay. So um, so Mr. Renu, if you could actually come and uh, share with us. <laughs> Namaste everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today and uh, I'll start this presentation by offering prayers to Indra Bhagavan to continue to be benevolent, to continue to give us those 2000 mm on which our water security is so dependent. Uh, I'll only be focusing on three areas. One is lifestyle changes that we have uh, incurred. We've all changed without maybe even realizing it. Then recycling and reuse. The word, the minute we use the word sewage, people seem to have a lot of apprehensions. And I'll try and look at it from a child's point of view. Why is it that we think of sewage and stink and things, all of those things which are not very favorable to us. And finally, rainwater harvesting. Climate change has brought about high intensity rainfall. So now it's no longer possible to have the traditional ditches. What's different, okay? That's a house when I, I'm 70 now. So when I was growing up, a house on the left hand side that you see would have been the kind of house or well-to-do house that could be considered. And that house would have had one single toilet on each floor and you would have had about four to five rooms. That would have been the general way of going ahead. But today if I move in, even a two-bedroom flat in uh, Bombay, oh, sorry, Mumbai, would have two toilets at least. So number one, we are ex uh, you know, expanding the number of things. And then, we are not just satisfied with having two uh, units. We would also have a plethora of things like we would like to have a bathtub and a shower point and many other things compared to what they were say about 30 years ago. So now what you've done is, like uh, Mr. Singh so rightly said, look at the demand. The demand is include, increasing many fold and not just, uh, what should I say, you know. Now look at the taps, the fixtures, how they have undergone changes. If you look at the one on the left, you were screwing it. You had some control on how much water you wanted flowing out of that tap. Today, with just a touch, and when you touch it, it flicks back all the way. So from zero to full flow, you go in a second without even thinking about it. In fact, keeping it at mid flow would require more effort than just letting it go all the way. So this is what we are looking at. And we, we have nobody else to blame. We make those choices and we have to make proper choices to know what we're doing. Lifestyle. I think I grew up using buckets or having a bath. But today, I don't think it's anybody except the kids who use it. Just see the amount of water you waste when you're still trying to get the temperature right before you step into the shower. You do it all the time without thinking. So before saying what somebody else needs to do, are we willing to go back? The chances are no. We've got used to certain luxuries. We would intend to continue using them. So what can we do? 
now that you have a plethora of fixtures that you have added into your homes, it possibly would be a good idea to check on leakages. For all buildings, you have structural requirements. 15 years, 20 years down the line, you need to have a structural test and you need to report. Why can't we do something similar with fixtures? Just to give you a very rough idea, when you see a tap dribbling, where the drop just about forms and then falls, it's not drip, 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 but it's forming and then dropping. That's about 10 drops a minute, and see how much water you waste on that. Three liters of water is we are wasting. Again, uh, for me, it's always been a, yeah. Whenever I look at societies, because I've done a couple of studies for USA, and what I found was that when we were looking at societies, you would have one set of fixtures for the people who were living, and another set of fixtures for the common staff. If there was a maid's room, the fixtures there would be of a much more inferior quality. Similarly, uh, the drivers and guards and all the washrooms being used by them would have a different standard of fixtures. Now, number one, they, may, they could be first-time users. They may not be very comfortable with the facilities that you're providing them. And number two, they are not going to come back and report to you saying this is leaking because then they think they've done something wrong and you're going to be angry with them or upset with them. Even in our own homes, when you see a washer leaking, how many of us pick up a phone and call a plumber who says 200 rupees for coming and 10 rupees for changing that washer? Because that washer is not worth very much. So we tend to ignore these things and we kind of tend to just let them you know, go by. Um, suggestion. Okay. Of course, you always have a hardware suggestion which says throttle things. But does it work? You always unthrottle it because you want to be in your convenience zone. Increase water tap, I've heard it, and I would have supported it, but right now I'm living in Goa, and I was very surprised with what I've seen in Goa. Goa, they came out and said, if you are a family, and this is the threshold of water we'd supply free, if you go beyond that, we are going to charge you. And the funny thing was, I did not see a single billboard saying, how do you go about reducing water? Left it entirely to you. You do what you want, but if you can stay within the threshold, we have no problems giving you free water. And I was pleasantly surprised when at the end of the year, they came out with a billboard saying 40% of the residents in Goa, it is of course the smallest state in the country, are not paying any water tax. That means you have given the people a free will to decide how they're going to utilize their water, and it obviously works. So I, it works both ways, because I've never seen anybody washing their feet with mineral, I mean, a bottled water. Nobody does that. But you have filtered water in societies which are just being used for flushing, and nobody seems to mind that. I have lived in Central Park One, which is called Course Road, Gurgaon, supposed to be prestigious. Every three years, they could afford to change the lobbies, furnishings, sofas, what have you. But to get them to put in a treatment plant and recycle and use grey water was like, no. We are sitting on an aquifer, we have access to water, and do we really care what's happening to the rest of Gurgaon? It has to be a change of attitude. Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas is what we keep hearing all the time. I hope we can imbibe it also. Okay? Um, moving on. Yeah, I, felt, I really felt silly right, writing that one down because most people know where they can reuse water and they can do it on them, themselves without gyan being given out from this end. <clears throat> Again, uh, what I really saw was gardening, gardening and more gardening. I would tend to disagree with that. What about all the construction sites which are going on? You need dust suppressants. Why can't that be sewage water? Why can't your firefighting be the water which people keep changing? So again, here are some suggestions. If we had a little more time, it would have been done at a more leisurely pace, but that's it. Um, yes, uh, this is one thing. Uh, I worked with the UN for many years, and I was working predominantly in the rural areas. You can see, in the urban area, the national law is 135 LPCD. And uh, in Maharashtra, it's 150 to 200 because People obviously need more water. And in the rural context, it's, it's 40 LPCD. Now that the country is moving towards, if you are a citizen of this country, the same laws will apply to you. I for sure hope 
that this divide is merged and we come to a figure which is true both for the rural and the urban context. Because we are just, and even here in the urban context, it's not like everybody is getting 200 liters. No. There will be certain areas which will barely be getting 80 liters and there will be other areas. Delhi for sure would know all about it. So again, there is that disparity. So now that the country is getting into that mode of the same law should hold true for everybody, we truly and sincerely, at least I truly and sincerely hope, we, there will be more equitable dis, uh, you know, distribution of these resources. Uh, another thing, whenever I have mentioned, uh, I started off my career using sewage water for cooling towers. So the minute I came out of my IIT graduation, I was working with sewage and it has never bothered me. Now when you say sewage, 80% of the people will screw up their nose, I mean face and hold their nose because the feeling is stink. It's not the sewage problem. The problem is how we have carried it. We have turned it septic before even bringing it to the treatment level. So if, I mean, here I'm requesting you to look at it from a child's point of view. You can say the nose is plugged, but there is no discomfort on the face yet. Please look at what, are, what is it that the sewage has. It's something that's gone down your throat at one time. So can we just tend to look at it in a simplified manner and say this is what it is. And the other thing, uh, when we talk into, uh, now if I had to recycle something, I would, what is sewage? 99.9% .9 water? Where else would I go? And possibly this is something that, has, and uh, of course the expertise exists on the tertiary treatment plant where we can use it with a degree of comfort. Here all I want to say is, um, the presentation from Italy did touch it. Uh, touch upon this and I was very happy about it because primarily settled, it can be done anyway. Secondly, we are talking about wetlands. Why have all our sewage treatment plants not functioned? Because there's a very high energy consumption that's required. People don't want to pay that. Plus there are chemical dosings required which have not been put in the correct amount at the proper time. You don't have the kind of skilled operators. You are trying to get a gardener or a clerk or somebody to do that intermittent dosing and run it. Please move away from that. Look at plants. Plants not only bring in the oxygen to do the decomposition, they also absorb things. So that was the presentation on wetland. Uh, it cannot be covered in such a short presentation, but should anybody want any details, I'll be leaving my email and phone number. If you send me a message, I will try and respond to you, each one of them, to the best of my ability. Okay? I've spent a lifetime working on this, and if I can even make one little difference, I'd like to do it. Uh, so it's treatment here, what I want to tell you is, uh, invariably the builders have given this excuse, but land is at a premium. We cannot give you land for sewage treatment. That has been the standard reason for saying we can't have anything else excepting equipment which uses a high amount of energy. I would not agree with it. Here, all I'm trying to tell you is if you have whatever is your flow rate, if you can have, you know, the what I'm calling the weed bed, that need not be a rectangular body. It can be any shape. It could be, you know, the peripheral thing where you want to grow your gardens or whatever. There can be many variations on that. And you really don't have to go in for something which requires so much energy and is so difficult. These are some of the plants. The most ordinary one would be the cana plant. Now, what's the advantage of having a plant instead of an equipment? In case you have a high slug load, your plant is just going to grow a little more. If you have a low slug load, some of your plant will die out and you will just pull out a bit of the plant and throw it away. It's really as simple as that if we want to bring it down into practical work. Uh, incidentally, uh, I'm not just talking about it. I've used the Pukuna Metro. For all our metro stations, I have used only this. There is no other equipment. After this, it goes through a filter and a carbon filter for the clarity of the effluent. Nothing more than that. And uh, rainwater harvesting, uh, talk about the survey development agency. I think they know a lot more about the hydraulic data, they know exactly where the weathered rock is, where you should be putting the water down. Because it's not just about trapping the water, but it is also ensuring that it will find its way to an aquifer from where you will be able to tap it again. So, uh, I mean, like, uh, lots of people ask me questions like, if, supposing I was to buy a plot of land, it's not necessary that if I drill a hole, I'll find 
water to extract. But if you tell the same people that fine, you don't have a well, but you should be doing rainwater harvesting, the question is why? But you could have a weathered rock strainer which would lead that water to an aquifer, which can finally be extracted not by you, but somebody else. So we'll have to look at that when you're talking in terms of rainwater harvesting. And here I'm going to, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll be very quick on this one. Here what I'm trying to show you is a typical ditch where you used to have a ditch and 80% of that would be covered with stones and gravel and finally the layer of sand where water would fall and then drain off. Here you can see the pipeline structure is a filter and my request would be when you're buying the filter, buy it incomplete. You're going to clean it and you're also going to be testing where the water levels are. So buy it as a you know, a composite thing rather than just a one-off filter. I buy the filter from you, he's the maintenance guy, and the third guy is going to come and tell me what is the difference this filter has made pre and post months. I apologize if I have overshot my time, but I couldn't make it any faster. Thank you. Thank you. So, we'll throw the questions and comments for later. Uh, so, I'll just go by the, the order in the agenda that has been given to us. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Shuman, if you could just share your thoughts on what you can say. Seven or eight minutes. Uh, uh, I hope I'll not try to move on. I think that is a very good place. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, afternoon, and thanks to Mumbai first for having me here. Uh, I though came with a lot of enthusiasm with not many slides, but I'll have to have a have one today. And uh, I'll stop at a few pit stops to possibly you know, make a few points. This is what was given to us, and uh, we landed up into this. Uh, you know, this droughts, floods, water is available to us, but we have used it this way. Um, at one hand, we do this, which is very good, but on the other, this. You all know this, but a uh, lot of challenges, and I don't want to go into details of that because positive time. But the point is, you know, um, some of those things that we have not even looked into, you know, in our challenges, which are adding up to it, for example, look at these, you know, plastic issues, emerging pollutants we have not talked about enough, not even in, incorporated that into our planning. What do our cities, you know, looking at as now, we are trying to treat BODs, EOD, etc., etc. What about these kind of pollutants? We have to incorporate that as well into our planning. Urban sector challenges, I don't want to go into details, it's probably well known, inequitable access, an inefficient kind of you know, distribution system into the kind of metering system. We do not even know how much water is being supplied in the system. A lot of guesses are around pipe sizes, okay, number of hours and so on and so forth. Most of you who are doing and dealing with the supply system would already know this. And then of course the biggest challenge, the tariff. I heard about the, the point about the you know, comparison between desalination and you know, the you know, recycling systems etc. If we do not have the rational pricing of water, how do we even calculate the cost benefit of any intervention for that matter? It's just not comparable. So the first step is that we bring the right valuation of water, real value of water to the level where it is required and then start comparing it with the others. I mean, remember Mahajan, two or three days of shutdown, and they were they ran into crores, crores of losses. Where is the cost benefit? So the point is, we need to look into the value of the resource, make the resource, you know, uh, properly, you know, a value, and then start comparison about various issues and and the kinds of benefits. Now, various other issues in the water distribution system. You might have heard about the mixing of sewage with the, you know, distribution water system. In fact, Karnataka in in Raichur, three people died. A lot of human cry and debates started happening every summer. You know, this is not the first summer when Bangalore is being talked about. Uh, Every summer we hear one of the two cities, you know, being talked about for some scarcity, some kind of problem. Is it that difficult to maintain? No. It is very easily to be, I mean, I won't use the word easily, but it is very much possible to, you know, plan it well in advance, lay out a, you know, program over a period of time so that we can avoid this kind of situation for sure. One of the things that we have not looked into quite well is about the handling of the water, I, I like to call it used water, but let's say waste water. Now, this figure has been shown, so I'm not going to deep talk, in, talk about it in much detail. But one thing you should note is that the kinds of gap between, you know, waste water generated versus treated is, is quite high. You know, in, in class two towns, you can see around 95% is the gap of, you know, what is being generated versus what is being treated. So obviously pollution will be an after effect. But where is the opportunity? I mean, this is Maharashtra, for example, doing, you know, a bit better. 
around 46, 47 percent is what is being treated. This is by the CPCB 2021 report uh, versus what is being generated. And then there varies in the states, you know, in different kinds of, you know, um, kind of uh, percentage of treatment. Pollution continues to be there. Yes, there are improvements because of the programs around Namami Ganga, etc. But pollution continues to be there. And until we achieve the you know, holistic kind of you know, treatment and therefore the objective and the uh, comparison with the standards, we will not be you know, able to talk about pollution less kind of you know, water body. And then there are impacts of climate change to aggravate the situation. Again, not going into detail, let us talk about two, three things which we have an experience on working with the cities. What needs to be done? So, reducing the wastage, resource recovery, improving the efficiency and conservation. Every sector, be it you know irrigation, domestic, or for that matter, industry sector. I want to share with you our work on water demand management for two, two, three cities that we have done in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, numbers will be different, but I think the essence of what I want to convey will remain same for almost every city in the in the country, and so will be the case about you know Mumbai. Demand management. What is it? We have seen it in other sectors, oil, you know, electricity. As the market price and scarcity is is uh, you know of the resource is. The prices are kind of fixed accordingly. You have seen it in electricity, you have seen it in petrol. Why not water? We are studying scarcity of water. But the problem is, we are considering this as a free commodity. So what is the water demand management? We are focusing on what we have to manage it better than going for a new source. Three, four major areas, technical, social, institutional, and financial. Now, I don't have time to detail it out. But the point I would like to make is, paradigm shift from focusing too much on supply side, laying more pipelines, basically managing what we have upfront within us and managing, distributing it and using it more efficiently from an engineering you know, approach to a more management approach. All right, just the concept possibly is best described by this particular you know, uh, sort of cartoon. Yes, some point in time we'll need desalination, new bridges, you know, everything else. But just look at the leakages first address them and move them ahead to the next kind of step. How do we do it? Have a policy first. Do an audit. One thing that I want to emphasize everywhere is audits. Unless you know the real kind of you know, situation of where is uh, where the water is going, what quantity and quality is going, how will you plan and how will you manage it? Like a health checker. We need to do it regularly so that we are able to appropriately plan it. And that's one most important part of the demand management. And then of course you can strategize my uh, heart needs more, you know, kind of uh, attention or kidney needs more attention, yes, leakages or or for that matter metering or both, you can decide and invest accordingly on that. Alright, so what we need to therefore do is, uh, so this is just an example of four cities of Madhya Pradesh, I'm not going into too much detail about all these terminologies because this possibly are known to most of you, non-revenue water. But I would want to share the summary of the findings of the you know, uh, study that we did. If you look into the four cities, Bhopal, Gwalior, Jabalpur, and Indore, uh, what we found was the losses to be in around 23% to 43% and the NRW to be almost in the same range around 28 to 43%. And you possibly cannot see, but uncertainty in calculation as well. Now that uncertainty is because, because of the you know, non-accuracy of the information available. Uh, so what we and just to give you another way of making you understand, so let's take it, take it the losses uh, of around 20%, which is the lower side of the estimation. Now, what does that mean, that loss mean? It's the size of a, you know, a mid-sized dam each year, and that's what we are talking about. This is the low-hanging fruit that we should focus on. All right, uh, a few things that I want to again share with you is these are the strategies on, uh, various strategies on, you know, on management of technical metering, etc., etc. Um, DMA approach, leak detection, I'll be running around, and then tariff fixing, and then of course institutional strategy, capacity building as well. I want to give you one flavor of the wastewater uh, recycle reuse, which I actually uh, again we have taken up in a, in fact in one of the um, G20, U20, you know, paper that we came up with as a task force together, we emphasized on these three four points, you know, regulatory reforms to promote water demand management strategies, integration of nature-based solution that was mentioned earlier. Wastewater to be treated as a resource rather than, you know, through recycle, reuse, and resources recovery, energy and nutrients and heavy metals can be recovered. I'll give you an example very quickly. Partnerships for integrated water management, sharing of knowledge, and then, of course, centering the city data. That's what I emphasized on the water audit part. All right, just last, you know, example on treatment systems are so much very advanced that you can make a drinking water out of your sewage water. It's just a matter of how do you strategize and you know how do you use it. So we just want to share with you a project where we actually are uh, you know we have used 
uh, along with ion exchange and other partners, uh, technologies which are very much usable to reuse water, recover resource, and, and do the resource recovery and reuse uh, altogether. These are the technologies, not going into detail, and it was SFD, MBR, these are low energy, low cost uh, technology, which can actually give you uh, water for reuse for various purposes, and as well as energy and other recovery, you know, in terms of nutrient. All right, I'll stop here. <laughs> Time is not so much, but maybe any detail we can discuss later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just use a couple of slides, keep it very short. I think uh, listening since morning and the presentations, I think uh, Mumbai has no incentive to save water. I think that's a conclusion I'm drawing. <laughs> I think we need to, if you're serious about uh, saving water, I think absolutely there are no incentives. You have, as Mr. Sanjay Uvalya said, you have dams, you have lakes, and you have pipelines to fetch water, and you have a lot of money, because everything is subsidized here. So I think we need to start building a narrative, why we need to save water, and how do you communicate that narrative? Can we really make uh, Mumbai water positive? Not by bringing water from dams, but making as a city, can you make it water positive? Means, whatever water is available, what we get, the consumption should be lower than that. Then only it becomes positive. Now, uh, just like to give a definition how other cities are looking at, there may be some incentives that we need to pull it out from this. I think one of the incentives, while the water is coming from gravity, water is free, pipelines are not free, probably that's one uh, incentive, number one. Number two, the wastewater is not, treatment is not free. It's while water is coming by gravity, wastewater management is through massive pumping. Unfortunately, even the wastewater tariff also is not passed on to the citizens. So I am not sure whether tariff is at least 50 to 70 percent of the water. Uh, I don't know about Mumbai. What is the tariff? It's about 50 percent. 50 percent. So it's a modest incentive to. So given that, I think we need to build a, a narrative to de-risk Mumbai from water shortage. I think that's the only narrative I can think of. Otherwise, as a citizen. You have water, your consumptions are atrociously high, uh, 250 plus LPCD. So given that, how do we create a system of, let's not talk about Bangalore and others because you have no incentive to save water. That's a starting point. So what we are doing is de-risking Mumbai from any sort of potential shortage. And how do we do it? How do we de-risk? What if the lakes dry? What if there is a conflict? What if there is a potential climate change resulting in some of the dams uh, having less water available for Mumbai? I think you need to, we need to start thinking about those scenarios. And one of the ways that I think easy ways to build a water security risk-free approach in Mumbai is through looking at a circularity approach and that's what we are doing in a couple of cities like in Gujarat we are working out the whole of urban Gujarat in Telangana we are looking at it so just to give you one or two examples of Telangana Telangana we have in Hyderabad as a city we have a circularity policy right now on the wastewater side wastewater there is a clear wastewater recycling policy not just as a policy but the tariffs the mandatory restrictions on groundwater, mandatory usage of tertiary treated water by industry. These are all very hard decisions that Hyderabad is taking to build water security. Hyderabad also, like Mumbai, we have perennial sources but 200 kilometers away. So there's a pumping cost. So building a incentive of lowering the cost of bringing water. So we have a recycling policy that is working, that is underway. The second important thing that we are doing is making each and every building water neutral. 
So that's a very strong policy that's coming up. For example, this is a building which has uh, it's a you know it's a commercial building as an illustration. This uh, building has a STP 300 KL STP sewage treatment. Now this whole building is net water neutral. What it means is whatever water that gets fresh water that we draw, everything gets recycled back for chilling, for flushing and for uh, gardening and other applications. So what we are doing is probably there is a hope in Mumbai to bring security and risk, minimize the risk of water shortage is making every potential building water neutral. It means certain change in policies, plumbing practices, certain technologies. So this is one example where 200 KLD of water is taken, only a small fraction of water is fresh water, rest of it is actually getting recycled and recycled and recycled. And this can be doable in another example, this is about uh, 600 KLD water. There is a bit of bleeding required because you can't recycle everything. So what do you do? We, we are creating a water market. All construction activity in Hyderabad shall necessarily buy only tertiary treated water. So we are creating a water market as a system, as a city, so that this treated water will go for construction activity or certain amount of horticulture activity. Now, how do you translate this to all the buildings, new buildings, as well as the legacy buildings, the hundreds and thousands of legacy buildings. So uh, this is where we have introduced what is called on-site wastewater treatment and recycling regulation. While BMC's presentation spoke about decentralized at a little bit larger scale, I'm talking about decentralization at every building level. The water footprint comes down, water usage comes down, energy usage comes down at a system level and that's what are the I think potential incentives. There are STPs at decentralized level, they are failing. So we are trying to revive them. There are uh, regulatory problems which we are fixing. I am not going to get into the details. So what we are trying to do is a law which makes all the new buildings above 5000 square meters. Currently the EIA notification is at 20,000 square meter buildings have on-site systems and they have to treat. Here we are lowering it to 5,000 square feet or 25 dwellings in a building requires on-site system. The on-site system is not great enough. It is mandatory that all these buildings have to have dual piping system and recycle water. Then only the efficacy of treatment will be established. It's not just treat and leave it in a nala or leave it in a drain. Often there is incentive to bypass the STP. And that's what happens even in Mumbai. So the way to get STPs work is to make sure the same building or a society recycles the water for flushing, for if they have garden, they can use for garden. And anything surplus water shall be traded. There are a lot of startups in India right now. There's a startup called Tankerwala in Hyderabad. They do, they do a huge business. What do they do? They take the treated water and sell it to the construction industry. This is a startup which is doing phenomenal business. Their turnover is about 45 crores right now. So they do this water trading, treated water trading. So that way we are creating a market. So the regulation is about number one, New buildings have to have STPs, tertiary treatment and dual piping and recycling, number one. Legacy buildings, they have to fix the problem. They have given a time period of one and a half years to get these systems in place for the new building, for the old buildings. So these are approaches that we are taking and we have a monitoring system, on-site monitoring system, real-time monitoring system to keep track. So going back to the whole story of of course, we need strong regulations for recycling. So, India doesn't have standards for recycling. Indian Plumbing Association has. So, we work with them and sort of notified the standards for recycling. So, that a household doesn't see the water as dirty water. So, it's very, very important to look at that. 
we need to create incentives and penalties for the uh, builders to introduce these dual piping systems and recycling system. So there are very strong incentives and penalties. So I think I'll stop here. I just like to summarize that Mumbai has no incentive to save water, but I think as a conscious effort and to de-risk Mumbai for any eventual climate change or related potential risks, I think one of the smartest and easiest way to deal with is make these beautiful buildings water neutral. I think that's a message I would like to. It is interesting that in the cases that you showed, um, water could actually be reused in the uh, society itself. And oftentimes the challenge that we face is that sometimes markets don't exist for excess water. And um, interesting that that has also been. Excellent point. So we have uh, Sri Deshpande now online. So we will be um, looking forward to this presentation. <coughs> Hello, Mr. Postpande, are you able to hear me? Hello, to hear me? Yes, I will able to hear you. I just joined. Okay, okay. So we can hear you. So please uh, go ahead with your talk. So we have some, um, you have some seven to eight minutes to present your views. See, we are running really short of time. Thank you. Yeah, can you go to the questions session? I will take some questions straight away. Is it better? Because I just joined, I just talked about the uh, sequence in the morning, what's happening here. So I'd just like to answer some questions. You can go ahead with the station and order to ask some questions to Okay, me. okay, sure, sure, thanks. Um, so maybe if the, so we'll just ask the the participants mm -hmm. to have questions here. Yeah. Okay. Please. Please go ahead. Can we get a mic passed to the gentleman out there? Uh, if you just, no, 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 just uh, in interest of the feed and everything, we'd just like you to be vocal on the mic, uh, of course, starting with your name and the question being directed, short and concise, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you heard, uh, Mr. Srinivasan's uh, observation, Mumbai does have a, what do you call, a uh, rewarding system in the sense of you know, charging telescopic rates for consuming anything above 135. Just to make a point for you. And, uh, but that is not helping. Uh, there is a tendency of using water because it's dirt cheap in case of Mumbai. Uh, that's a fine statement. So we need to develop this culture, as you said, uh, of you know, intelligently using water in this famous state. So both these uh, aspects combined, we could uh, make a change. And Mumbai does have plenty of water. That's why I have to also Sure. That's a contribution uh, to the conversation. Do we have any question? from anyone. Alright, let's go to the lady at the back first. I also like to acknowledge the ones at the back uh, who have been paying attention. We uh, appreciate that. And if you could just say your name and uh, keep the question short and concise once again. Hi, um, sorry I'm back through. I'm Anuradha. I'm uh, Executive Director of uh, UDRI. Um, and uh, in your presentations, we've been 
how to listen to solutions, solutions to problems that we've created, right? And uh, what we're not focusing on are the policies that are resulting to those problems. Um, I'm an urban planner and I'll talk about the policy. Last development plan um, allowed for open spaces on the ground, Mother Earth, allowing for percolation. This development plan allows for 100% of podium level open spaces. Now, in the previous panel, we find they're trying to say that yes, there'll be um, um, rainwater harvesting methods that would take care of that. But we've seen problems with these kind of solutions. They, they're a mere checkbox exercise. Um, no one is there to take care of the fact that they're sustainable and they're working. So what about the policies that are leading to these problems? We have solutions, but we're not talking about the policies that are causing the problems. Sure. I think well said. Uh, would anyone from the panel like to resolve on or agree or disagree with the her on the policy front? <laughs> I think uh, I'll be very frank, you know, in these sort of rainwater harvesting is great. But Mumbai has no incentive to uh, preserve rainwater. It's not value of Hyderabad. And we are not dependent on groundwater predominantly. In Hyderabad, every house has a bore well. So we have an incentive to take care of the groundwater and put a rainwater harvesting structure. Though I may not benefit, my neighbor may benefit because of that. Because sometimes I put a catch pot and use it. But Mumbai has no incentive to put, have rainwater because you have pipe water coming in cheap, free almost and then the wastewater treatment is also free. So I will be very frank with you that even if you have urban planning with all the open spaces, substantial amount of water security will come, substantial through wastewater recycling. Rainwater harvesting is a sort of a security but Wastewater treatment, which is almost like you get 100 units of water, 85 units is wastewater. And that can be captured. That has a big incentive than rainwater harvesting, which is good as a social cause, as a social consciousness is good. But you don't depend on groundwater. That's a big problem. Sure. A big I want to respond. Sure. To yes, please, please. Uh, can I agree more with you on that? In fact, uh, any intervention that you talk about, its sustainability depends on whether you inbuilt into the planning cost, the ONM and the ownership about of that kind of intervention. I mean, a number of you know such interventions like pond rejuvenation, when what I was mentioned as well. Even for that matter, wastewater recycling we use when you are engaging some kind of you know local community. Who is going to maintain? Who is going to pay uh, at the end of? Have you planned it at the stage when you are planning the entire intervention? And that's something that we have very strongly recommended in the policy brief on wastewater recycling, reuse, and social recovery, mainstreaming them uh, as one of the bottlenecks, and that needs to be addressed. I mean, uh, I just want to mention you as well, to you as well, uh, the perspective about how the interventions which were actually meant for the people just could not be, you know, taken by them later on because nobody thought about what after creating the infrastructure. And uh, I just had, you know, one, you know, kind of interaction with the Jalji you know, mission uh, staff. I asked them one very simple question, what after the infrastructure created, are the local community, the, the panchayats accepting your, you know, intervention by paying themselves? The answer was, we don't know as of now. So, yes, I agree with you. Possibly the policy intervention has to look into that for the sustainability. Uh, well, apologies, uh, we do have a lot of interaction in place, but I'm sure a lot of you would uh, uh, not agree with me if I cut down the lunch time. I'm, I'm really uh, apologetic of that because we're already overshot as per schedule for 20 minutes, but you guys uh, did deliver on 60 minutes uh, as uh, committed. I think uh, we have a lunch break uh, just preceding uh, this, so we're going to be continuing the conversations between the panelists and uh, our speakers. Um, so, Mr. Deshpande, are you still there? Yeah, I am. I am around here, sir. Yeah, so Perfect. Uh, so, there is so, a question for you. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Yeah. Deshpande, Mr. Sanjay uh, is going to be asking you a question. We are just going to be getting him a mic so uh, you can hear it. Uh, we did not yeah. want to leave you out of conversation and Mr. Sanjay has been very kind uh, to address the question directly uh, to you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Deshpande, thanks for joining us on this conference. Uh, I wanted to ask you, since you are in charge of the Viti River, project, yeah. how much of uh, the uh, the effort in in, uh, in treating Bitti uh, River water 
Are we actually using that water for recycling and uh, are reusing clockwises? Is that, is that a part of the plan? Or are we just trying to look at flooding as one of the major uh, aspects that uh, Mitty River is trying to address? Yes, sir, uh, Mitty River primarily is, is a flood protection uh, uh, area. Uh, along the Mitty River plus the mudflats and the Nigerian flood protection and flood absorption. That's the main focus. <coughs> Mitty River water treating is a is a difficult thing because it's not a canal river uh, on the on the north side. Because if you go from the MCM side from the position of the river till uh, the Kurla side at the airport side, the river is not perennial. And then the downstream we have a seawater influx that is a tide level. So treating of Mitty River water in fact is not done. But what is happening is why the quality of water in medium is improving on two fronts? One is because of deepening, widening and the bed slopes. The water velocity has increased and the water has reached the self feeding velocity in the southern part, that's the MMRD portion. So you saw the mineral oxygen levels are, uh, have increased and the POD survey levels are fallen down. That's what is happening on the southern side. On the northern side, because of the great work done by MCGEN and Pollution Control Board and the zero discharge policy of MPCB and industrial policies on the northern side, the industrial discharge has drastically come down. Now, along with that, the encroachment removal has also happened, and therefore, uh, whatever uh, open dedication was happening on the northern side around the slope plan, that is not happening. So, sewage is not now getting directly into the river. And whatever the catchment area is there, MCGM is doing a fantastic work of increasing the uh, sewage network in the catchment area. So, a lot of water is now, instead of directly unneeded coming to the Viti River, is being collected at the sewage network in the societies and being treated to the treatment plant. So the discharge which is now, which is the residual discharge in the Mitty River is slowly improving its quality. That's what I'm hearing. But still if you see that we are nowhere near to the potable thing, neither is aspiring to make the Mitty River potable. What we are only trying to say is the discharge in the Mitty River will be the primary, secondary, tertiary treatment discharge which is coming into the Mitty River. So I answered you right this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one more question to the to the deputy, um, uh, you know, agent in chief engineer. Uh, I I really liked your presentation. It was really very good presentation. Thank you very much. Is there any plan to compulsorily make use of the water? Because now Mr. Deshpande also said that there's plenty of water available in Mithi River, which can be used for non portable purposes for construction and things like that. Which is what I think uh, Mr. Chari also talked about. Is there any policy underway? to make it compulsory for all the builders to, or all the new building construction uh, uh, companies, to make it compulsory for them to use that, and for uh, for gardening purposes or car washing purposes, to use this grey water. Uh, sir, actually, for builders been having a higher line, say, land parcel, say, area, say, around, say, 15,000 square feet or square meter. So there is a compulsory provision for what? provision of rainwater water scheme and even STP also. And if they are really operating STP properly, so there is an incentive given in their property tax also. But to be on the practical side, this is not happening. Because as somebody already said, the proper operation maintenance, some governance, some checking. So over a period of time that people, this is unofficial part, they, they try to close that treatment. So that is what happening actually. So, to be very frank, as I said, we have to change the people's behavior. As I said, yes, yesterday water is a, uh, say, stale water. Say, I can add, sir, one more thing. Say, this particular world water day, the theme is what water for the peace. Forget about the international way. But whatever water we are bringing from 100 km, 150 km, the, the villagers there, they are really facing lots of scarcity of water. <coughs> so we have to make some peace here also. And for, for that purpose, some, some, something is required. And that is what are recycle and reuse of waste water. So purposely, uh, so to make in a, in a lighter mood, I suggested some ways and all. But that is really needed. Otherwise, it is not possible. So over, and again, I am repeating that uh, tariff. Whatever 5 rupees, 6 rupees per 1000 meter, highly subsidized. Highly subsidized. Very problem is what? When we are trying to say we are saving treated wastewater, BMC also saving treated wastewater to some of the. We are just trying to develop that. But we, we are forced to save it at the what? At least no loss, no profit, no loss. That is not good. 
we have to save it highly subsidized highly rather than cheaper than the fresh water cheaper than the fresh water then over a period of time then the people will develop the habit of using treated waste so that is what the small suggestion i think this discussion can be go longer and longer and we have to build it thank you So well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salvi, and I think uh, the panelists have been very kind, and uh, so have all of you been uh, with us. Uh, on that note, uh, we're going to be leaving uh, conversations to uh, the lunch, and uh, we're going to be requesting our uh, panelists to now please stand for a group photograph. But also, if I could have Mr. Ashok Desai, Vice Chairman of uh, Mumbai First, to help us with the felicitation of all our uh, eminent panelists on stage. Let's give uh, Mr. Desai a warm, warm round of applause. And we welcome him on uh, the stage to help us with the felicitation. And we request all of you to come, Mr. Desai. Please do join us. Yes, please. Please do join us in the group photograph, ladies and gentlemen. A big, big round of applause for all our eminent uh, panelists and. Uh,